So we're going to start off with goal three. It's the upper arm, the axilla, and the arteries, like muscles and stuff. So the upper arm, it branches into the shoulder, arm, forearm, and the hands. These are the things we're going to talk about, and it's connected to the axial skeleton. So what is the axial skeleton? It is the majority of your body. It's your vertebrae, your skull, and your rib cage. Okay, that consists of the axial skeleton. What connects to the axial skeleton is your upper limb and your lower limbs. That's known as the appendicular skeleton. All right, so where the upper arm and the axial skeleton, axial skeleton connect is at the sternio, the sternoclavicular joint. This joint I have drawn right here. It's called a pectoral girdle. Pectoral girdle only means it's like your pecs and then your manubrium and your sternum. It's a bone that's coming right down. So I drew right here, manubrium, and I drew the sternum. And right here, you can see like your ribs. This will be your rib cage. Remember that this part right here is part of your axial skeleton. The rest of it is appendicular skeleton. Okay, so the sterni sternoclavicular joint is right here. It's on both sides. It's a saddle joint, so movement occurs in both planes. And it connects your clavicle. This is not the best picture of a clavicle, but it connects your clavicle to your scapula. Um, if you look over here, this is what the scapula is supposed to look like, right here, and this is what the clavicle is. And this is how your body is basically attached, your limbs are attached. So the clavicle is a really strong and like important bone because if you break, break your clavicle, you can't move your arm too much anymore because this is holding everything together. So the clavicle, scapula, and then I'm going to talk about different areas of the of each. So first, the clavicle, it connects, what did we say, the upper limb to the trunk, and it allows movement of the arm, right? So above the scapula, we have the acromion, which is right here, and then the coracoid process. These two bones are held together by another joint. It's a plane, a sliding joint, so things can move back and forth, and it's called the acromioclavicular joint. That makes sense. Acromio for acromion. And then clavicular is where the coracoid process is going to be, a chromioclavicular joint. Okay, so if the clavicle is holding the scapula in place, then the scapula can uh, transmit like energy and force into the humerus. The humerus is the first bone in my body. But before we get there, let's do a little clinical correl correlation with the clavicle. So the clavicle, it can be fractured in the two, two different regions, the lateral one-third or the medial one-third. So let's remember though, let's not get confused. Lateral is away from the body and medial is towards the body. So the lateral area is gonna be the furthest away from my clavicle or from my uh, manubrium. The medial portion is gonna be the closest to my manubrium right here. The middle portion is the middle of the clavicle. It doesn't really break too much or fracture rare occasions. So there's two different ways that the clavicle uh, fractures. One way is for hypothetically speaking, let's say someone falls, right? They fall on the floor and they brace themselves with their hands. So their hands, they transmit force from their hands to where? Travels to their wrist and from the wrist it's going to travel up the radius and the ulna. I have radius and ulna right down here but we're going to talk about that more later. The radius and ulna is going to tra transmit the force or the weight to the capitulum and the trochlea, which is where the joint of the radius and the ulna is going to be. After that, the weight's going to travel through the humerus, and it's going to go up through where? The scapula, right here. So the humerus is going to transmit the force into the scapula. The scapula is then going to transmit that force into the clavicle, because the scapula is held on to the body by the clavicle. So after the clavicle transmits the force, it goes to the manubrium. However, the manubrium is our sternum. It's like the middle of our body. This is not going to really fracture. The clavicle is where injuries are going to occur. So what did I say? It's the medial one-third or the lateral one-third? The medial one-third right here. So the weight goes to the manubrium and right here cracks, right? Or the lateral one-third furthest away, the weight goes to the scapula and then right here, when it gets right to the clavicle, it's going to fracture. Okay, this is more common in children because they're still growing, their bones aren't as strong, they fall a lot, they brace themselves, they fracture their clavicle. Okay, also this occurs 
say, contact sports, you're getting tackled in football, your clavicle could break, or you're playing hockey and someone could crack into your shoulder, your clavicle could break. It's not always weight-bearing, but it's most common in weight-bearing and in children. Okay, so that's basically all the clinical correlates of the clavicle. We'll keep moving forward to the scapula. The scapula is composed of, it's one bone, it's weird shaped, it's not a long bone or a short bone, but there's got many different like little functions and notches that we're gonna talk about. The top part of it, right here, is be, gonna be called the superior border. So we have to remember, superior is up top, inferior is on the bottom, medial is to the inside, lateral is to the outside. Okay, so it would make sense for superior to be up here. But let me stand on this side. Whenever we're talking about the body, it's an anatomical position. So hands are down, body straight up, hands are out like this, right? Hands are open this way. This is anatomical position. So if this is anatomical position, we have the scapula, we have two of them. One is gonna be facing this way, the other one's gonna be facing this way like this, right? Because you need one for each arm. So the medial border right here is gonna be the closest one to your sternum right down the middle. The lateral border is going to be the furthest away, lateral, okay? Superior border up top, and we would think it would make sense to have an inferior border. However, we have form a triangle, so there's no border down here. Instead of a border, it's called the inferior angle. See, it makes like a little nice 30 degree angle opposed to a border. Also up top, we have a superior border right up here and the superior angle. This is more of an obtuse angle, but you guys understand. Other than that, in the scapula, we have the suprascapular notch, which is right next to the superior border, and we also have the suprascapular fossa. So whenever we talk about fossas and stuff, the body, the bone is not gonna be straight. It's gonna be like caved inwards, like a little cavity. That's what a fossa is gonna be. So the scapulas, they have fossas. This is the suprascapular fossa. Next, to connect the scapula to the rest of the upper arm, we have to talk about the humerus. The humerus connects to the scapula through a joint called the glenohumeral joint. This is the connection between the head of the scapula, uh, the head of the humerus right here, and the scapular notch, which is right here. It makes sense what the name of this joint is. It's called a ball and socket joint because there's a ball right here and it's in putting into a socket, ball and socket. This joint has all range of, all different types of ranges of motion, all, uh, abduction, adduction, protraction, retraction, circumflexion. Also, we have to know it's a synovial joint because you need synovial fluid or else you're gonna form arthritis. Now, the humerus, we have different, different um, structures of the humerus. And the first structure we're going to talk about, we're going to go in descending order, so from superior to inferior. So the top of it, this is the head, and right underneath the head, it's called the anatomical neck, which would make sense. The head of my body is here, and right underneath it is the anatomical neck. Next, we're going to have a greater tubercle and a lesser tubercle. The greater tubercle is superior to the lesser tubercle, and the lesser tubercle is inferior to the greater tubercle, so above and below. In between these two tubercles, we have the intertubercle sulcus. It's just the little ridge in between both of these tubercles. Below that, we have the surgical neck. Okay, so let's backtrack. We have the anatomical neck up here, but below it is the surgical neck. Why is it the surgical neck? So when most people break their arms or they need shoulder reconstruction or different cavities, they don't really mess with the head of their humerus because it's more sensitive and it's easier to crack. They're gonna do the operation right here at the surgical region. You could do a nice flat cut. That's why they call it the surgical neck. Underneath that, we have the intertubercle sulcus. Oh uh, no, we have the deltoid tuberosity. This is where your deltoid is gonna insert. And then you have the shaft of the humerus, which is the body. From here all the way down, this is the shaft of the humerus, right? So now I'm gonna talk about this and then I'm gonna blow it up more over here to make more sense. So the bottom of the humerus, also known as the inferior portion of the humerus because we talk about anatomical terms, we don't just say up, bottom, below. So these two regions, these two little protrusions are gonna be called epicondyles. 
Before we talk about the epicondyles, we're going to talk about the supra epicondylar ridge, which is going to be right above it, so supra for above, and lateral because anatomical position, lateral side. And then you have the medial supra above, epicondylar ridge above the epicondyle, but it's medial. So that's going to be right here. These are going to be the two ridges. Beneath that, you have the lateral epicondyle, the first protrusion, and the medial epicondyle, the second one. So if you're given a bone on a test or you're just looking, mainly for skinny people, you could see it. You can't see it on my arm, but you could see a little bone protruding out of your body. This little bone is known as your medial epicondyle. If you see a bone on the floor or they just give you a bone, you've, the first thing you look for is the head. When you know you're at the head, you know it's superior. Now you look for the bigger protrusion. The bigger one's gonna tell you it's the medial epicondyle, so you know where superior is, inferior is, medial and lateral, and you'll be able to distinguish what structures you're trying to tell you, talk about. Okay, after that, we're gonna have the capitulum and the trochlea, which I'm gonna talk about over there, but we're gonna have the radius and the ulna. So two different things to know about the radius and the ulna. The radius, I, this is how I remember it. The radius is on the right side. Uh, just think of it as my right arm. It's gonna be the same thing for the left, but if the radius is on my right side, I write with my thumb and my finger, right and radius sound similar. So my radius is on the lateral side, outside. I write here, connected. So that means the ulna is on the inside or medial. So radius, lateral, ulna, medial. Okay. So the radius and the ulna are going to connect to the humerus and they're going to form the forearm, uh, the elbow joint. So when we're talking about, I'm going to blow it up, like I said, this is going to be used for flexion and extension. So the humerus, this, just think of the bottom part of the humerus or the inferior portion, right? Is going to have two different things. We're going to have an olecranon fossa and a trochlea. Okay. The olecranon fossa is just a little, what did I say fossas were? In the subscapularis, right? We had just a little cavity. Same exact thing for the humerus. So now the olecranon fossa is a little cavity in the humerus. This cavity is literally for the use of the olecranon. The olecranon is on the, ra is on the radius. This is the radius, so it's on the lateral side. And it's got this little point up top, right? It looks like a claw. So this little claw is gonna insert, pretend this is the humerus and this is the radius, it's gonna insert like this. This region right here is gonna grab into the humerus and you could see, I could allow like this, it can move like this. This olecranon goes into this fossa. Underneath the olecranon, we have the radial notch, right? The radial notch is gonna be used, once again, hold on. The ulna, this is this is all for this side is all for the ulna. This side is all for the radius. The ele, the olecranon is on the ulna, the top the superior part of the ulna. This goes into the olecranon fossa. The radial notch, however, is used for the radius. I'll talk about that in one second. If we keep talking about the ulna, the ulna is the one that looks like a claw. U for ulna. It has a styloid process on the bottom, and that's all we should really talk about for the ulna. However, we need to discuss the trochlear notch. The trochlear notch is going to be on the bottom, right here. This is the olecranon, and this is the trochlear notch. So remember I said the humerus has the olecranon fossa? It also has a trochlea. The trochlea acts like a fossa. It's this little region on the bottom. And this is where the trochlear notch inserts. So trochlear notch, olecranon, right into the humerus. So it can move up and down, or flexion and extension. Attached to the ulna, we also have an ulna tuberosity. It's where mu other muscles and tendons are going to insert. And right next to this, I have the radius. The radius, we have the head of a radius, and then we have the shaft, and then we have a styloid process. The head of the radius, right here, is going to insert, or it's going to be connected to the ulna in this radial notch of the ulna. They're going to form together, fuse together. But this radius, you see how the ulna is like a claw? The radius is flat. It's going to sit on the humerus flush together like that. So it's gonna be flush to the humerus so they both groove up and down. It helps with stability. Attached to the ulna, we have the styloid process. And attached to the radius, we have the styloid process. These two bones 
prevent my wrist from over, like, I guess you could say moving. Like, if I don't have these thylak processes, my pinky could touch my forearm or my thumb could touch my forearm, which is probably not too good for my arteries, veins, joints, etc. So, pause it. Before I keep continuing about the humerus, the radius, and the ulna and how they connect to the hand, I'm going to talk about how the humerus, some clinical importance about him. So some clinical things about the humor, humerus is how it fractures. So like I said, someone falls, brace, the hands brace, travels to the wrist, goes to the ulna and the radius, capitula and trochlea, spoke about, and then to the humerus. But instead of traveling down more into the manubrium, into the clavicle, etc., we're just going to fracture our humerus by impact, by force, some rare occasions like... You could fall and fracture, but the main thing is like through a traumatic injury, like accidents, car crashes, falling downstairs, etc. So the first thing we're going to talk about is if you fracture the surgical neck. Remember the surgical neck is right here, below the greater and lesser tubercles. That's the surgical neck. So the surgical neck fracture, we're going to have right here we have an artery, right below we have the vein. Right? They come together. If you fracture the surgical neck, we're going to mess with the axillary nerve and the circumflex humeral artery. Okay, so the axillary nerve is going to be talked about later on, but the circumflex humeral artery is the artery that helps you, sends blood to the muscles, or to the bones and the muscles, and it helps with circumflexion. That's what we mean the surgical neck. Now, if we fracture the shaft of the humerus, we're going to mess up with the radial nerve and the bronchi and the the radial nerve and the profundi brachii artery. That's gonna be right over here. So artery and nerve are gonna be right on the side. Now, another thing is that we have a supracondylar fracture. Where would a supracondylar fracture be? Okay, so we have the lateral and medial epicondyles, but right above that we have the supra and uh, the supra epicondylar ridges, right? The lateral and medial. Right over there is where the fracture is going to take place. If you damage this, you're going to have, um, whoa. Okay, median nerve and brachial artery is going to be affected. And the last fracture is going to be the fracture of the medial epicondyle. Okay, important. I said it was the inside, right? Right here, medial epicondyle. If you fracture this, we're going to have ulnar nerve and ulnar collateral artery damage. So ulnar is what? UCL, ulnar collateral ligament. So right over there, you're going to have the ulnar collateral uh, artery and ulnar collateral nerve. That's going to be affected if you fracture the medial epicondyle. It's really bad for tennis and baseball players in particular. So next, we're going to talk about the hand. So remember, if we're talking about anatomical position, right? The hand should be this way, however. However, it's easier to discuss it when you just put your hand on the board like this. Think of my hand on the board like this. Still, pretend it's anatomical. But like this, so this is the posterior part of my hand, anterior part of my hand. So we're going to look at it in an anterior view. So if we look from the end of your fingers down to where your wrist is going to be, we have phalanges, right? So each bone or each finger has three different bones. One, two, three, right? So this is the distal phalange, the middle phalange, and the proximal phalange. Distal, meaning furthest away from your hand. Distal is far. Proximal, right here, meaning closest to your hand. Distal, proximal. In the middle, you have the middle phalanges. Okay? Each one, your thumb, uh, index finger, middle finger, ring finger, and picking finger, have the same exact bones. But now, if you look at my hand right here, I have my thumb, index finger, middle finger, Ring finger, pinky finger, right? I'm going to have a little. One, two, three, four. Carpals, right? These carpals, or metacarpals, right, are very important to the body. These things help your body move, your wrist, etc. So we have eight of them. I, this is the acronym that I use to remember the bones of the hand. So if we're looking at my hand, so we're looking at this one, right? Same exact thing. We have scaphoid, lunate, 
Triquetrum and Pisiform, right? Straight line to Pinky, Scaphoid, line Looney, two Triquetrum, P Pisiform. Straight line to Pinky, right? And now if we go above it, here would be Hemi, here for Hemi, comes right next to it, Capitate, the Trapezoid, and then Thumb, Trapezium. So a straight line to Pinky, here comes the Thumb. That's a good acronym term or mnemonic to remember these different metacarpals. So we have the Scaphoid, Lunate, Triquetrum, Pisiform, Hemi, Capitate, Trapezium. Trapezoid trapezium. So, important clinical correlates that we should talk about about the hem is over here. So the first thing, if we had a lunate dislocation, which would be this bone, right? A lunate dislocation is going to involve a couple things. One thing we could have anterior displacement, so your hand's going to be what pushed forward, right? Your bone is going to be down, and or forward anteriorly, right? This happens for people who type a lot usually. This is carpal tunnel syndrome. This compresses the median nerve. So you're gonna have a nerve that's running through your arm. It's called the medium nerve connected to the lunate. This is carpal tunnel syndrome. The next thing we could talk about is boxers. You punch a wall. The first thing, when the waist is first, you're gonna fracture the hamate bone right here. So attach to your pinky finger. Fifth metacarpal, hamate metatarsal is your boxers fracture. The next thing is the fracture of the hook of the hemi. So kind of like the boxers, but a little different. It's right underneath here, your hemi. And say you go down and you fall, right? The first thing's gonna happen, your weight is gonna get dispersed to your pinky, and then you're gonna fall in the outstretched hand, like I said. This is the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. So, what did we say? Radius, outside, ulna, inside, medial, right? You fall on your hands like this, your hammy, right, is connected here or here? It's here, by the pinky, right? But this is medial or lateral. Looking at this angle, it would be lateral, but we have to remember anatomical position would be this way. So it would be medial. So the ulnar side is on your pinky side, medial. And then this fracture, you lens, it's going to run up and it's going to affect the deep branch of your ulnar nerve. This is called the Guyen's Canal. The last one is a fracture of the scaphoid, the one by your thumb, right? This is your fall on the palm of your hand, right? Or in your wrist, right? And it fractures your scaphoid. This causes um, avascular necrosis. Remember we talked about necrosis was death of things? Well, this is gonna be the death of the bone. It's not gonna be death of a cell, it's gonna be death of a bone. This is gonna cause degenerative joint disease. Not too good. Okay, so that's all we should talk. That's all we need to know about the upper limb with the bones, etc. Now I'm going to discuss the different types of muscles. Okay. okay, so now the muscles. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to go through some of them right now, and we're going to talk about the anterior axial appendicular muscles of the pectoral region. Okay, let's break this down before we talk about it. Anterior, front. Posterior back. Anterior. Axio. Okay, what is axio? Axial skeleton, not appendicular. Axial skeleton, so body, like rib cage, vertebrae, uh, skull. Appendicular. So the muscles that do what? Okay, so this is the bones, anterior axial bones of the appendicular muscles. Okay, appendicular is appendicular skeleton, so limbs. So we're looking at the, the muscles that are on these bones, but that do functions for these limbs. So the axial bones for the appendicular limbs. Okay. The main, the four for the anterior axial appendicular muscles, the four ones are the pec major, pec minor, serratus anterior, and the subclavian. Okay. So before we talk about it, we have the pec major is the one superior, so superficial. Deep to the pec major is the pec minor, so it's underneath it. So if you're doing an anatomy dissection and you cut the body, you peel off one muscle, you have the pec minor right underneath it, right? Right underneath that, if we're looking at the manubrium and the sternum, right? Same exact structure, but this time the muscles, connecting to the 
what is this? Medial or lateral? This will be the medial side of the scapula. It's going to connect to the, the scapula is kind of behind, right? So the muscle is going to go this way. It's going to insert to the front of the manubrium or to the sternum, right? Right over here. That's going to be called the serratus anterior. Anterior for front, serratus, right? And the last one is going to be called the subclavius. Subclavius, underneath clavicle. Subclavicle, subclavius. This could connect right here. Clavicle to the scapula, as I have here, clavicle to the scapula, right? Okay, so things we should talk about. We obviously know spinal cord is very important in efferent, right? Not afferent, afferent is getting the message. Ever efferent, with an E, is sending the message. The spinal cord is going to tell what muscle is what to do. Okay, so we're going to talk about the C5, C6, C7, C8, and C1. The cervical, right? And then this is the thoracic vertebrae. We're not talking about all of them, we're just going to talk about these right now. Okay, so we know that there's different nerves that come out. So the first one we're going to talk about is the pec major because we're going to go in order. The pec major has C5, C6, and C7 innervation, right? For what part? The lateral pec. pec. So the C5, C6, and C7 are for this side of the pec. It's not going to be the middle. It's just the, or not the medial. It's just going to be the lateral side. C8, however, and T1, thoracic one, is going to be for the what? Medial portion of the pec. Okay, so now we have lateral, we have medial. All five of the spinal cords, or all five vertebrae, are for the pec major, right? Okay, what does the pec major do? Okay, let's think about it. Pec major is on the anterior portion, right? It's connected to the axial skeleton, but it's going to do something to what? The appendicular part of the body. So, So we have the shoulder, right? This is where it's gonna connect and it's gonna help with flexion. So like, remember this is flexion of the shoulder. This is gonna be the pec. Hold your pec when you're doing this. Flexion, you can feel it moving. And we could also, if it's out here, the pec major is not gonna help raise it because that's gonna be a job of something else. It's gonna help bring it back to your body. It contracts when you bring it back to your body. This is gonna be adduction, A-D-D, -D, add, to add to your body, right? The last thing it does, it medially rotates at the shoulder. Okay, so if you're standing like this, anatomical position, you could feel your pec is kind of stretched out. Now if you flex it, just flex it, your hand starts to turn. Medially rotates. Medially rotates. Medially rotates. Okay. Next muscle, I'm going to talk about the pec minor. You see right here, I said pec major's up top, pec minor's underneath. Pec minor has... C8 and T1 innervation. It's not innervated by C5, C6, or C7. It's just innervated by C8 and T1. Okay, it's D. What does this do? It helps stabil stabilize the scapula right up here. So it just pulls the set scapula in, in place and it helps to interiorly and anteriorly rotate against the thoracic wall. So just remember pec minor is for stability. Next, we're going to talk about the serratus anterior. Okay, serratus anterior, I said, helps connect the clavicle to the manubrium, right? So now if we think about it, what could this be used for? Okay, this muscle is used for protraction of the scapula. It's innervated by C5, C6, and C7, 5, 6, 7. This is known as the thoracic nerve, thoracic nerve, C5, C6, and C7, right? Okay, so protraction and retraction. If you retract your body, you pull it back. But this would not make sense because this muscle is connected from the front to the back. So if you contract this muscle, your body's not gonna go backwards, it's gonna go forwards. So you're gonna retract your muscle. So the serratus anterior helps with protraction. Now, a clinical importance of this. If we have C5, C6, or C7, also known as a long thoracic nerve um, inhibitor or an injury, right? This long thoracic nerve is going to be cause paralysis of the serratus anterior. So this is, if this is not innervating this muscle, telling it to fire, etc., that means this muscle is in paralysis, can't move, like paralyzed. If that happens, if you ever see someone walking around with like a chicken wing formation with their bones sticking out, it's because they're constantly protracted 
and their scapula is sticking out in a wing formation. That's what it does. The arm cannot be abducted past the horizontal position because it's messing up with your body and you're walking around protracted. That's the chicken wing thing. Okay. <sighs> Lastly, the last muscle for the anterior axial appendicular muscles of the pectoral region is the subclavian. Okay. Subclavian, like I said, here's the clavicle right underneath it, subclavicular. Sub subclavicular. It helps with what? Depresses and ankles the clavicle. Okay, so it's connected to the clavicle, but it's connected downward. It's not pulling it upwards, it's pulling it downward because it's sub. So if this muscle contracts, meaning it gets smaller, this is going to happen to your shoulders. You're going to repress it, you're going to depress it, it's going to go down, it's not going to go up. Okay, the last part we're going to talk about is the axial posterior appendicular muscles. Okay, axial. Like we said, vertebrae, skeleton, um, skull, ribcage, right? But it's the appendicular muscles. But posterior, what does posterior mean? Posterior, back, backside. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about, it looks, this looks like a body. This is not a human body with the legs. This is just the way I do the muscles. I'm not an artist. Okay, trapezius is the first one. Very weird shape. It's the most superficial one. If you're doing an anatomy dissection of someone, the first muscle you're going to see after you go through the skin and after you go through the fascia is going to be the trapezius. Okay, so the trapezius is many different regions. Let me draw my thing. Okay, the first region I'm going to talk about right here. It goes all, all the way up to like where my neck is, trapezius. I have the arrows drawn away, right? From the neck away to the, kind of like to the shoulder, right? This is called the descending fibers because they're oriented in a descending fashion. Okay, these fibers, right, they're obviously superior because they're above, inferior would be below. If they contract, meaning they get smaller, what's going to happen? You're going to elevate your what? Scapula. Your scapula is going to raise. So these fibers on the trapezius help with raising the scapula. These are inter innervated by what? Cranial nerve 11, not spinal cord, we're talking about cranial nerve 11, and then C3 and C4. Okay, why cranial nerve 11? Look how high up it is in the body. It's by the brainstem. C3 and C4, also higher up in the brainstem, are going to help innervate these nerves. It's closer. The closest region is what you want to innervate. You don't want to make your body work harder than it has to. Your body's smart. The next region we're going to talk about is the middle, right here, right? These middle fibers... I have the fibers drawn from the medial to the lateral angle, right? That's how they're, that's how they're uh, structured. So if they contract, what's going to happen? If they're this way, your body's going to what? You're not going to protract. It's not going to make your body get bigger in your back. They're going to contract it smaller, so your body's going to retract. Your trapezius or your back's going to go this way. That's what your middle fibers are for of the trapezius. The last fibers are the ascending inferior fibers of the trapezius. See how I drew them upward? Because they're ascending. Okay, what are they gonna do? If they're drawn upward, right? And they're going up my body, if they contract, get smaller, what's gonna happen? Oh, my shoulders are gonna lower. This is for lowering of the shoulders. So they're up here from the descending fibers, right? I know it's contradictory, you just have to bear with me. Descending up top, ascending down low. But these descending fibers elevate when they contract. These ascending fibers, right, lower when they contract because they get smaller. Those are all the fibers of the trapezius. That's all the trapezius does. Okay, so the next one I'm going to talk about is the latissimus dorsi. So now it's not underneath it, it's this way. I mean, it is underneath it, it's just deep. So if you peel off the trapezius in uh, dissection, the latissimus dorsi would be right underneath it. Lats, remember people walk around like this? Huge lats, latzilla. So you have C6, C7, C8 innervation, right? Remember, these are the vertebrae, cervical vertebrae. What are these used for? Okay, they help with extension and adduction, right? Okay, so they extend and adduct, but what do they adduct? Okay, so if your body's up here, right? You're pulling down, they're adducting, they're pulling you closer to your body. Adduction, right? This is the major muscles for shoulders or the major muscles for people who climb. If you're climbing rope, 
Mountain climbers, they have really strong lats because they're always pulling themselves up. This helps them pull themselves forward. If you lift your arm up and you hold right here and you just go down, you could feel this muscle actually moving. Next, which is deeper to the, both of these muscles is gonna be your rhomboid major and minor. I really couldn't draw it in 3D, but I'm just gonna highlight it blue. Okay, these are your majors and minors, right? The majors above it, the minor is right underneath it. Let me outline the minor in red to make it look a little better. Major up top, minor below, right? Okay, all these, they're innervated by C4 and C5. Okay, C4 and C5. There's some overlap here. Where's the overlap? So C5 over here, C4 is over here, whatever. This is called the dorsal scapular nerve. C4 and C5, they join together, and it's called the cervical, or the dorsal scapular nerve. Dorsal meaning backwards, right? Or behind, ventral forward. Dorsal is the same as posterior, ventral is the same as anterior. Okay, and what does this do? They also help retract the scapula. How does this do this? Okay, right by the medial fibers of the trapezius, right? The medial fibers of the trapezius retracted. Well, these are the big muscles now that are helping retract it, right? They also help with glenoid fascia rotation. So what does that mean? Just the glenoid fossa right here, right? Clavicle, humerus, right? Glenohumeral, right? If these retract, right? The muscle fiber helps inferiorly, right? Inferiorly rotate the humerus. So what would that be? Pronation or supination? Pronation, inferior. Pronation, supination. Supination, forming the bowl of soup. Pronation, the opposite, I don't know. But supination, bowl of soup. Okay. The next, five, the next muscle we could talk about is gonna be, mm, that might have been it. That's my TED talk. Hmm. Hmm. So the last one was the levator scapulae right here. This is just like the descending fibers of the trapezius. However, it's another muscle. It's what? Right above where? So levator scapulae. Okay, levator scapulae is right here. Levator, like, I don't know. I don't know, levator, I'm pretty sure in Latin it's like elevator to raise something. So it's going to connect, right? High up to the neck, right here. Right? So this, when this contracts, it's going to also aid in the descending fibers, which try to elevate the scapula or raise the shoulders. And that's all it does. It also helps with uh, rotation of the glenoid cavity, like inferior rotation, obviously. But that's, that's it. And it's innervated by the C3, C4, and C5 nerves. So the C3 and C4 cervical and the C5 is the dorsal scapular nerve.